Turning tables too, that's, that's a specific term used in the industry. And um, when we, before I uh, invested in you, you, you mentioned this term so many times and you were saying, look, the concept of how a table is turned uh, is critical to understand this business. Could you sort of walk us through uh, the importance of that metric? And, and how, sure. how, how also the technology improves that? Right, so uh, first I'll just go through table turning. If you've got people waiting for a table, that means you've got revenue sitting at the door that you might use. Right. So it becomes really important to get people in, sit them down, give them food and get them out so you can see more people. If you can see 400 people during a time of four hours, if you're at a peak time where you've got people waiting for a table and the table turn is an hour long, you can reduce that by 12 minutes on average because of order for me, you can pay on demand. So if you think about how long it takes, it's about 10 to 15 minutes on average to be done with your meal and uh, find the server, ask them for the check, get the check, pay the check, tip and leave. That's a very, very long process that doesn't need to exist at all. <laughs> order for me lets you tip, pay, and leave immediately and instantly. And the table turns on average 12 minutes faster by default. So Instead of 400 guests, if you shave that 12 minutes off, you can now in four hours serve 500 guests, you get a 20% increase in revenue every day, just based on 12 minutes per table being turned. So it's a huge KPI for restaurants and something that we significantly reduce. And, and I think that was unique about you because you really took time to understand the industry. You know, I don't understand the restaurant industry. I invested in order for me and you, because uh, I wanted exposure, but you would think as an external person, it's just about getting people through the door. It's a marketing challenge, right? What you forget is the concept of, you know, the bottom of the funnel, the conversion rate, and actually how long it takes you to, to serve someone uh, could mean the difference between profitability and not profitability. M Michael, what, what does the average restaurant operate at when it comes to, uh, you know, net margins or net, net profit? Oh my God, it's, it's, the best restaurants are like 10%. Uh, and and what about the average? What about the average restaurant? Six to seven. It why so do why do people bother running this? Why is it one of the most common tenants of you know uh, re, uh, of, of like commercial retail space? You have restaurants. Why do people like to run restaurants? Every restaurant person I've ever met hates their job. It's very difficult. I mean, loves it and hates it, but swears that you know I would have done something different, or uh, you know I don't recommend doing this. If you tell someone you're starting a restaurant, they say you're crazy. It's going to be a long time, and you're most likely to fail. I actually heard that from every person that I talked to that owned a restaurant, when I suggested, told them we were opening our own, uh, they all looked at me like I was crazy and said, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Which is very interesting. I mean, there's people that they have chosen this or it has chosen them as their life to do it. So um, I think there is some level of passion for that lifestyle of that everything is crazy and then it's eight hours and oh my gosh, everything is nuts and we gotta do the books and get the tip outs and make sure everybody's happy and we love our employees and we're a family here. I think there's a, a level of enjoying that lifestyle that doesn't need to be cutthroat and stressful in terms of like getting a promotion or going up the ladder. In fact, most servers that I know, uh, they make way more than managers on salary. So it's a unique circumstance where it's almost just a, a fun lifestyle. And I think that plays a lot into it. Um, yeah, that, uh, that kind of sorority and fraternity of people that say like, you shouldn't do what I do because it's too crazy for you. Um, I think there's a love and a passion for that in hospitality itself. But it is demanding, it is time consuming, it takes you away from everything else that you need to do. And for those reasons, I don't also I don't understand for the margins and the profit that you do get as a smaller uh, business, it, it is interesting. Yeah, you know, I started a company called Vangol and to put it at its core, it was simply an ad agency. And we automated everything an ad agency would do. We built a mobile marketing platform. Eventually, it was acquired for almost a billion dollars, or $780 million. And at that time when we started, we saw how inefficient it was uh, to run an agency, how manual the processes were. And of course, when you bring in automation, when you bring in deep learning and AI, um, you can really start to see gross margins improve significantly and ultimately we, we were very profitable when we sold as well. So uh, I do believe in the future that 
the restaurants and even the operators of what we call tenants in the real estate sector, those who adopt PropTech will certainly um, first, you know, see, have an advantage, improve their NOI, but also they'll probably be mega companies. I mean, if you take technology, you can scale so much faster and it will change the dynamic. I'm curious as to know in the future what indoor dining will look like, especially once this is a standard, especially once you get smarter money coming in. You know, I think that's something we need to see as well as smarter money coming in that can actually be ambitious and scale brands and, and change the indoor dining experience completely. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate that you say that because um, we've seen a lot of other companies, like you mentioned earlier, Order For Me came about pre-COVID as a convenience product. And as soon as the shutdown hit last year, we've seen so many incumbent companies coming in with very similar products, with products that they're pitching as the same or similar. And some of them have, have raised a lot of money uh, to date, uh, well beyond where we're at. And something I'm always encouraged to hear is, don't worry about that. Uh, you can raise money in the wrong direction very quickly. And my one of my biggest concerns in the beginning of the shutdown and pandemic was that I was going to be the first one through the door and get shot. And our company was at the highest risk level. Watching these other companies come up and emerge and raise money beyond where they can take the product, they needed to, I think, stay small the way that we have um, to face the challenges that happen every day and the way that you want to emerge. Every restaurant is different. Every market is different. Um, we've had to make so many product updates and changes that I think if we had raised money uh, at a more massive scale in the beginning, we probably wouldn't have the product we have today and we'd probably be making the mistake that a lot of these competitors are making. So uh, it is encouraging to hear you say that. Yeah, and it can be very um, disheartening when you're running a company and you see competitors come and you see them raise funding. And when you read the headlines, it makes you feel insecure. I've been there myself. And you get distracted. You start to play catch up, right? Rather than being the leader, you start to play catch up when they launch a new feature, when they, when they hire a certain person, when they open up a new geography. You feel like we have to move faster, we have to move faster, and that's not how game-changing companies grow. Game-changing companies change the game itself, right? They don't play tactics, they play strategy. And you've got to appreciate, if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're trying to launch your company or you're running a company and a competitor raises a boatload of funding, you've got to appreciate that that might slow them down. This is your chance to double down on your strategy, to be more capital efficient, to be faster. I can't tell you, and this ended up happening to my company too. We, we ended up, it wasn't a function of we raised too much money. We grew very quickly, right? We, we, I took the company from zero dollars in revenue to you know, about $400 million plus. And so much bureaucracy starts to creep in when you hire an executive team and you have layers of management and you have lots of money to manage, frankly, and controls in place. And what used to, you know, it, it took us like, we were in an incubator for the summer and we came up with our prototype and we pretty much, you know, had orders and we started making some revenue shortly after. And we built like an entire product set. Whereas when we were uh, six, seven years in, we'd wait three, four quarters sometimes to make, you know, large updates to our product. And you just think to yourself, it's the smaller startups. And that's why large companies like Google and Microsoft have appreciated. It's sometimes those small companies, you know, the next Larry and Sergey who are working in a garage on their next startup, that's the one you've got to be worried about. So if you're an entrepreneur listening to this, my advice would be focus on unit economics, be lean, because that money will slow your competitors down and it's your ability to move fast that can make a difference. And also, also I, I frankly think um, the best time to take venture capital is also when you don't need it, and also when you want to ex when you want to double down on the sales and marketing and growth. Um, if you're raising a bunch of money to build more tech, th that's very risky. More engineers do not make a better product. Sometimes a few engineers is what you need, or maybe one engineer. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I love that. It's it's true. I, we have such a small engineering team, and we are running circles around all of these other companies as far as our product goes. Um, we are getting features that. We see in other products coming out now. Um, and for me, that's just encouraging. That lets me know that we're doing the right thing. We're making the right uh, decisions. And if other people are copying our features, 
and we're still months ahead of them, even six months, eight months, we're in a really good spot. It took them a very long time to take some, pick up something that took us two or three weeks to build. That's right. And as you are one of the pioneers of this technology, um, there is a strategy for the first mover, but there's also a strategy that you can adopt when you are somewhat a second mover or a third mover and there's other com competition in the industry. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when we were expanding Vungle globally, we were definitely, um, I would say, the, the first mover. And we'd go to markets, we'd open up an office in China or Japan or Korea or, or Singapore, anywhere, right? And we'd spend so much energy just doing thought leadership and teaching people about why they need our technology solution. Competitors would come in who are second or third movers and they, they could skip that. They didn't have to invest in all this marketing infrastructure. They could just come in and focus just on typical just getting sales in, right? So sometimes when your competitors are out there in mass, they're actually training the industry. The way I'd look at it is, you know, I hate to use a food metaphor, probably incorrectly too, but you know, they're, they're cooking the meal for you, right? Now you can eat it, it's no longer raw. So you've got to rethink that too. When there's competition out there, they just made your job easier. Every time a competitor calls a customer, they are educating that customer. And sometimes it takes 10 plus hits to score a customer or 10 plus contact points. So when your competitor's out there and they've contacted a prospective customer and they failed, hey, that, that lead is now ready for you. So look at it that way too, psychologically, rather than being dismayed and throwing in the towel. And your business is one where it's definitely about execution, but the market size is just enormous. Yeah, that's a um, great point again, because what we see in a lot of these bigger companies too, one, they're training the market and the customers on QR codes. Every restaurant knows how to take a QR code and somehow affix it to a table, and they do not think it's ugly anymore. Uh, one year ago, it was very difficult to suggest this QR code be on every table of a restaurant where they put so much focus on the brand and the experience visually that the customers have. Now they're clamoring to have these QR codes because otherwise they are perceived as unsafe. So that's one that obviously is, is huge. Two, these bigger companies with worse products, um, I've used a lot of them. I, we go on product missions, we, we use the competitor products. A lot of them don't hit with customers. So when you raise money, I think very quickly like they have, they're forced to adopt larger partnerships, bigger chains, and they have to adopt a product, again, like the tabletop machines that are good for the restaurants, what they want, but do not serve the customer need perfectly, and then customers do not or cannot use them. In a lot of instances, we see QR-enabled menus that are built to let you order and pay from your phone, but the restaurant staff doesn't support that functionality for whatever reason. And I know that we've gone through eight months um, in our earlier days of nailing it so that the staff of the restaurant supports our product. We had to get tipping high. We had to get tips above 15% or it wasn't going to get implemented. I can see exactly how these other companies have not gone through that process or are going through it at a much slower pace because of the scale and the partnerships that they developed. Sounds like, uh, so sounds, like you also, of, sounds like you also appreciate there that if the tips aren't above a certain percentage, the technology becomes a threat, right? The concern becomes technology is replacing my job as a waiter. If you can position the technology in a way to help them improve their revenue, then just as I would say a lot of people were against Uber initially, and then you know California does something stupid and tries to, or many <laughs> countries do try to clamp down on the Ubers, uh, people go on strike and pro not strike, people protest actually because this is their livelihood and that's what disruptive technology does. It, it, it might be positioned um, or it might be perceived as a threat, but it seeps in and it becomes an essential way of doing something and before you know it, you've taken it for granted. Your livelihood now depends on this one platform. It's scary yeah. too, but you know, in the right hands or with the right founder who's focused on making it a win-win situation, it truly can be great. Yeah, and here's the thing that's, that's scary right now is pre-pandemic, the restaurant industry was so fragile already. You've got six to eight percent as a profit margin. You've got employees with a minimum wage that is already going up who already can't handle the volume of work that they have on their plate. So without order for me or a product like us, we really don't see a very good uh, full service dining future for the world. I mean, just in the United States, based on those costs, you hear from restaurant owners all the time, 
they can't compete with labor costs. It's, it's, and I've seen it firsthand here. So when you can really reduce that, but also continue having the best customer experience, when you've got the best servers on staff and two of them can handle what eight people used to do and they can provide an even better guest experience because they're more free. I mean, think about it. You've got a table of six people and you've got to split six credit cards and a payment. You've got two people that want a water. You can see their hands up, but you have to ignore them. Those are the things that don't happen anymore because those six people, they're paying on their own and you can handle this conversation. We see uh, servers that you know are nervous that they're regulars. They interact with the regulars all the time. And then when they adopt order for me, <laughs> you've got 20 people that came in and gone uh, that gave you passive tips. And even if the tip is 12%, you spent 90% more time with your regular who is tipping you a lot more too. Give people the interactions that want it. And for the people that do not want to interact with you at all, they exist. There are about 30% of customers that walk through the door right now. The best customer experience for them is to sit down and talk to each other and that's it. That's hospitality. It's the person's choice. Yeah, and sometimes the waiter can inadvertently frustrate and create a horrendous experience. And I don't mean the food, I don't mean the steak wasn't cooked properly. I mean, I've been sitting here waiting forever to place this damn order. And then, you know, it doesn't end when you give your order to the waiter. You're now relying on that waiter to communicate that order to the, the kitchen staff. And sometimes that waiter might make a mistake or there might be a misinterpretation somewhere what i like about technology is it's black and white you made your order you can confirm your order you can see it and what you see is what you should get ideally um, so I, I definitely see that michael do you have uh, any questions for me any advice you'd like to ask either as uh, an entrepreneur or um, to me as a real estate investor or you know a vc yeah, as a, a VC, it's interesting. I mean, you recently posted something on LinkedIn that I thought was very interesting uh, about your initial decks as an entrepreneur when you were pitching. Right. And it was basically about the narrative that you really focused on and paying attention to the slides and the design. I found myself early on, I still am in that trap where it's, it's very visual, it's very story uh, telling, and that's where I'm focused. I have a TAM set slide, I've got a market um, and addressable feature, but you're suggesting that the visually and the story, I can't really hook anybody that's professional. Well, what I'm saying is, and I posted this on LinkedIn, got about 600 likes, and I found that when I was a founder, I was so obsessed with getting the narrative right. I obsessed over it. I would try to build the perfect pitch deck, slide by slide, and you get so involved into it that you can't see the bigger picture anymore. You're focused on the narrative and you're assuming every, everything that you do is very logical and it will be interpreted that way. It'll be interpreted and be appreciated by the end user here who's an investor. I, I literally was so proud of my deck. I'd be like, oh, this is perfect. It flows so well. But that's because I assume people bought into the way I, I built it. And VCs don't operate like that. VCs are flooded with so many decks. They want information as quickly as possible. And I'll tell you as a VC, and I posted this, these days when I look at a deck, I, I, I'm firstly, you know, there's so many decks to get through. The longer they are, sometimes I'll just have to kind of put them uh, in a different place in my inbox and I'll get through them later because it was like 20 slides. And I just can't look at 20 slides right now. You know, I want to give it the time it deserves. I like to see short slides ideally. And I want to see a few simple things. I want to see a clear visual of the problem. I don't want a huge bunch of text, a clear visual of the problem. I want to understand how large the TAM is, which is the total addressable market. How many billions of dollars is it, ideally, right? Well, however you break it down. I want to see uh, what traction you've had. Or if you don't have traction and, and great hockey stick graphs, tell me how many uh, customers you have and what you know, key logos are on the deck, right? If you have big brand name logos on the deck or you're in early discussions for pilot if you pre-seed, that is... Um, that's, that's a lot better than just, you know, uh, a, a lot of slides or whatever. Uh, I want to know who you are. I want to know who the team is. And I don't want a huge bio. Um, you know, ideally, a few bullet points, a few logos. And then, um, you know, why are you better than your competitors, right? I like to see, ideally, a, a competitive matrix, which can be a four by four quadrant, or it might be a table where you outline 
what you do and then like you have these ticks and crosses, a feature comparison of what you and your competitors offer. And you've got to appreciate the VC looks at the deck usually as a gate. Does this tick my box? If it does, then let's talk to the founder. Then walk me through the narrative. I can't buy the narrative and I don't want to hear the narrative until I can essentially tick a few boxes. Um, and look, that's just a function of the fact that VCs are incredibly overwhelmed with so many deals and you, you have to just train yourself to quickly and efficiently get through deals. You, you can't read this like a, you know, a fiction story novel, right? You have to quickly skim this like you would in a daily newspaper when you're on the, uh, you know, public transport trying to get to your, your work. And that's an old metaphor now. No one will probably use public transport for a long time, but that's how you want to do it. So yeah, that, that's my advice, and um, I think it's something that can be helpful for uh, entrepreneurs. And you know what? Entrepreneurs can then spend more time building the damn business and not be distracted by this deck. When you are an entrepreneur and you ask for advice on your deck, you're going to get pulled in so many different directions. And if you have three or four advisors, each advisor is going to tell you something different. Just keep it simple and get it done with. Appreciate that. Is it really worth trying to build the perfect narrative when the investor on the other side is overwhelmed, has probably tens of decks to get through very quickly and is struggling to find time. That's great to hear. Yeah, I, um, I really appreciate that last point too. When you take advice, it just is overwhelming. Really, like I've heard it just 180, complete different parallels, like side to side, back to back in the same deck. People are like, move this slide here? No, move this slide back. Um, well, Michael, on the concept of advisors too, can be very dangerous to have advisors. And I don't mean you have to pay them. By the way, I never paid any advisors when I was running my company. You know, I, 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 m my thoughts were pretty much, if an advisor is asking for money, they ain't worth talking to. Because, you know, you want advisors who are successful enough who don't need to uh, try to pinch money here and there. And it's gonna offend a lot of people. I know a lot of people make their livelihoods by being advisors, and I have nothing against that. But the way I did it, you know, um, I, I looked for people who wanted to legitimately give back. Now, here's the other issue or danger with uh, advisors. If you have a formal relationship with an advisor, or you even have an informal relationship with an advisor and you're asking them a question, um, if that advisor isn't able to um, appreciate that as an advisor, they're just supposed to give you information, let you decide what they want to do with it, and they get offended you didn't follow their advice, it becomes very irritating, because suddenly as an entrepreneur, now you're thinking to yourself, damn, you know, I just went to this advisor, I got their information and I got their advice, and I don't actually agree with it. And then yeah. they're pinging me, hey, Michael, you know, how's it going? Did you take on board my advice? I see you haven't changed this feature yet. I see your deck still looks the same. I see your financials still have this in it. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, what do I do? This is pressure and you're less likely to go back to that advisor. So just appreciate when you're an entrepreneur and you have advisors, you need to set very clear expectations and say to advisors, look, my job as a founder, CEO, or executive is to just take the information you're giving me and decide what to do with it. I'm not a yes man, right? And sometimes it's clear to let advisors know that. I'd have people who I would talk to informally who would say, what I love about you is that you always follow my advice. And I'd be like, oh my God, this is like bad reinforcement. I need to break that cycle, right? Yeah. And they're, they're training me, they're training you as a founder that, you're doing a good job when you follow my advice. And that's arrogant and that's really dangerous. And if you're an advisor listening to this, please be wary of the power that you hold with the people you're trying to help. You're probably not doing this advertently. Inadvertently though, you're creating a lot of pressure on entrepreneurs and you need to appreciate when you give your advice, always make it clear. There will be no offense if you don't take it and you should be taking advice from many angles. And as an entrepreneur, realize if you take advice, you're going to be pulled in different directions. It's your job to just step up, be a CEO, be a founder, and make decisions and not dilly dally around asking for too much advice. Just make the call and move fast. Last time we talked, you mentioned something uh, about can I build a competitive product to my own? I think having you preach a little bit about that on this video might help a lot. Uh, it was something that I found to be very helpful. And I wanted to take notes on it again. Uh, this was about your, your product, Bungle. So what was the question? Uh, last time we spoke, you said something that you tried to think through was, can I build a competitive right. product? Right, yeah. So 
the hallmark, when I was first talking to investors, the question was, what's sustainable about this, right? It's my favorite question. What is your sustainable competitive advantage? What that really means, folks, is can you build a company so powerful, so strong, that you could never compete with it yourself? When um, I you know, exited Vungle and the company was sold to Blackstone, I thought to myself, okay, what's common and what you hear about is founder sells company and starts another company in the same industry. And I thought to myself, there's no way I could compete with the company I built. They have so many barriers to entry now. We have such a great team. We have so much technology. We have you know, just an immense amount of IP we've built. There's no way in hell I'd be able to compete with the company I started. And I think that's what you want to do if you're a founder is build a great company so powerful, so intimidating that you would be as a founder who tends, founders tend to be the most arrogant, cocky, optimistic, especially when they're, you know, repeat entrepreneurs, they're like, I can do it again, right? Well, you want to build something so intimidating that you'd say to yourself, I'd be crazy to try to compete with what I built. That's the goal of every founder. If you do that, um, your company will survive without you, it will grow without you, and you will have built something magnificent and huge, and competitors will no longer be a consideration. And by the way, I ran my company, and we talked about competitors earlier, I ran my company in a way that we weren't too focused on competitors. Of course, we'd have a BI function, we'd learn as much as we can about what competitors are doing, but we also saw it as flattery. We thought to ourselves, that's amazing. <laughs> the copycat, you know, focusing on our features, that's like someone stealing your blueprint for this very complex architectural project you have. Good luck stealing the blueprint. You're not going to be able to put the pieces together. It's going to be, you know, a house of cards, really. It's going to crumble eventually. So when you build a blueprint, when you build a product roadmap, when you put so much thought into it, you will design things differently. When competitors react knee-jerk, you can just laugh about that fact. Their product will be exposed. I'm going to leave everyone with one last anecdote as we've talked a lot about competitors today. I don't recall the name of the brands involved, so I'm going to make them up, okay? But it's a, it's a story I remember hearing about actually when I was in college. I was doing a master's in technology entrepreneurship, and this is one of the few useful things I learned, okay? Um, let's call it McDonald's and let's call it, you know, KFC, right? Let's pretend we're in the early days of the industry. McDonald's is doing really well in a certain location and a new competitors come on board and they decide to open up shop and open up a restaurant right opposite McDonald's, okay? Now, a lot of people conventionally would be like, oh my God, okay, we need to reduce prices, we need to put a sale on, they're opening up next Tuesday. What does McDonald's do? McDonald's decides to shut down for the week. New company comes in, sets up their restaurant right next to McDonald's and oh my god the queues are tremendous and from the outside it looks like this is a great success the restaurant's overwhelmed they don't know how to handle this huge queue they don't know how to process all these orders and in the end people realize we miss mcdonald's damn it we want to go back to mcdonald's once they open up and so that's that's what great companies do they realize like what we've built is is so sustainable that if competitors come <laughs> we'll send customers to you and i did that when um i was um I was running Vungle, uh, companies would come to me and they'd say, your competitor is offering us this crazy guarantee. And I'd say, you know what, go take the guarantee. You know, honestly, I'm not gonna compete with that. If they're gonna give you $100,000 to integrate their product, go take it. But you know what, when that money runs out, when the performance starts to drop, we'll be here. We are never ever going to compete and give revenue guarantees. We're a solid, reliable partner that you can count on years and years from now. Guess what? Every one of those occasions, short term, we took a hit and we literally did turn away customers. So not turn away customers, we pointed our customers to our competitors sometimes. And those customers came back and said, you know what, firstly, you guys had integrity. And secondly, you're right, you know, you're right. Performance of, um, the performance eventually declined and we came back to use your ad platform. So that's the bottom line. Focus on building a great company and that's, uh, that's the right way to do it. Don't focus on competitors. Brilliant. That plays perfectly into where we are right now, yeah. saying I appreciate that last sentiment. Cool. I appreciate you having me on. I think that that's time. Uh, yeah, appreciate all of the advice on the podcast sure. and outside of it. Uh, Zane, you're one of our, one of our, definitely one of our best investors, and I appreciate your advice. I take it into account, but no guarantees. All right. Bye. <laughs>